Nintendo has released its own technical specifications for the Switch 2 console hybrid, but it's fair to say that the detail is somewhat selective. And by and large, uh, that's absolutely fine, right? It's been a long time since the firm effectively ducked out of the technological arms race against Sony and Microsoft, and on-paper comparisons hold little weight for a company that concentrates on its own types of experiences. Uh, nevertheless, a more detailed look at actual specs does give us a good idea of system capabilities and also allows us to get some perspective on the strengths and weaknesses of the hardware that developers will need to get to grips with and work with for the next six, seven, maybe even eight years. Now, obviously, there have been plenty of leaks surrounding Switch 2 in the past. In fact, we did a video on those leaks over a year ago, and while we were pretty convinced about their legitimacy, asterisks and caveats were attached. We just didn't know for sure. There was that proverbial grain of salt. That changes today, as we've now got rock-solid confirmation on the Nintendo Switch 2 specifications. A lot of what we're going to be talking about focuses on perhaps the vaguest element of the official spec, uh, described as a custom NVIDIA processor. Now, back in the day, Nintendo described the original Switch's processor as a custom NVIDIA Tegra processor, when in reality, it was essentially a vanilla Tegra X1. However, the new chip described in shipping manifests and NVIDIA leaks as T239 is very much custom silicon designed specifically for Nintendo and for mobile gaming. Here's what it looks like. And yeah, at this point, what we are looking at is confirmation of pre-existing leaks, but with some additional detail. Starting with the CPU, NVIDIA and Nintendo have indeed settled on the ARM Cortex-A78C, running the ARM V8 64-bit instruction set with cryptography extensions enabled. 32-bit not supported by the SDK, by the way. Looking at the official specifications shared by ARM, there are various cache configurations available, but the Switch 2 iteration of the A78C has 64K of L1 instruction cache and another 64K of L1 data cache. Moving on to L2, each of the eight cores has 256K of cache, while all eight cores can share four megabytes of L3 cache. So, the original Switch's Tegra X1 featured ARM Cortex A57 cores, four of them with one reserved for the operating system, leaving three free for developers. There's a similar ratio in Switch 2. Six of the eight cores are available to developers for games, with two reserved by Nintendo for running the operating system. CPU clocks are confirmed, but still a bit of a mystery in some sense. In mobile mode, the CPU runs at 1100 MHz, but this drops down to 998 MHz when docked. I still don't have an explanation for this, but uh, memory bandwidth drops in mobile mode, which would likely have an impact on CPU performance. That could possibly be offset by a slightly higher clock. Just a theory on my part. Interestingly, Nintendo does specify that the maximum clock for the CPU is 1.7 GHz, a lot higher than the other specified figures. Again, speculation here, but this could be a theoretical maximum that Nintendo could open up at some point in the future. Back in the day, Nintendo improved loading times on Switch 1 games by downclocking the GPU on loading screens and using the thermal headroom to ramp up the CPU to 1.785 GHz. Faster CPU, faster decompression of assets. Still, this is an established spec point, even though the 1100 MHz and 998 MHz core clocks are indeed confirmed for developers. Let's talk about the graphics hardware, and again, what we're effectively looking at is confirmation of existing spec leaks. Switch 1 used the NVIDIA Maxwell architecture from the GTX 900 series uh, with 256 CUDA cores. Switch 2 uses Ampere, as seen in the RTX 30 series for its GPU architecture. Similar to the Switch 1 GPU, think of it as a miniaturized version of a consumer GPU. 1536 CUDA cores are confirmed, as are the clock speeds. 561 MHz when running in handheld mode, 1007 MHz when docked. 
Again though, there is a maximum stated clock of 1.4 GHz on the GPU, and seemingly, according to documentation, developers can adjust the clock rate. But again, it's unclear if running at higher than the standard handheld slash docked clocks is actually possible. I mean, if we think back to what happened on Switch 1, initially the GPU in handheld mode was clocked at 307 megahertz. But this kind of changed over time as Nintendo adapted to developer needs. Uh, moving on, it's worth pointing out that developers don't get full GPU resources though, some of it is being reserved by the system. Make no mistake though, this is a full Ampere GPU rated for 3.072 teraflops when running in docked mode according to Nintendo, so by extension that should drop to 1.71 teraflops when running in mobile mode. Not going to be doing any comparisons against other handheld devices here, certainly not when it comes to comparing teraflops. In terms of GPU performance, it's going to be down to the games to do the talking at this point, in a world where memory bandwidth is hugely important and where the concept of quote-unquote flopflation, as Mark Cerny puts it, makes comparisons kind of meaningless. Moving on, obviously DLSS has been confirmed by Nintendo and Nvidia, as has Ampere's ray tracing features. Switch 2 is rated for around 10 gigarays per second, doubling up to 20 gigarays per second when docked. Of course, ray tracing is taxing on a resource constrained system like the Switch 2, so it's no surprise that we've not actually seen any RT effects in any games showcased to date. But surely it's just a matter of time. In some of our simulated tests using a downclocked RTX 2050, we were able to engage ray tracing. And in some scenarios, it can indeed be game changing. Memory next, and again for those keeping up with the leaks, there's no new information here on the hardware side at least. Switch 2 uses 12GB of LPDDR5X on the motherboard leaks seen so far. This is delivered via two 6GB modules. Memory bandwidth is confirmed as 102GB per second when docked, against 68GB per second when running in handheld mode. The speed of those modules is downclocked, presumably to decrease power draw and increase battery life. Nothing new here, but what we can now confirm is that of the 12 gigabytes of available memory, 3 gigabytes of that is reserved by the system itself, leaving 9 gigs available for developers. Compared against Switch 1, the older console shipped with just 4 gigabytes of memory in total, with 3.2 gigs available to developers, so Nintendo is certainly reserving a much bigger chunk proportionately of total RAM for non-gaming functions in this generation. Next up, let's talk about a piece of hardware that as far as I know is fully custom made for Nintendo, the FDE or File Decompression Engine. Switch 2 features substantially upgraded storage versus the original, 256 gigabytes of UFS storage which users can augment with micro SD express cards up to 2 terabytes in size. But faster storage is just one element in reducing loading times. Data is typically compressed on storage, so not only does it need to be loaded into system memory, it needs to be decompressed, historically a job for the CPU. Switch 2 can defer that decompression task to the FDE instead of the CPU, which should be a lot faster and more power efficient. The file decompression engine is a hardware accelerated solution for unpacking LZ4 compressed files and all of this is a part of dealing with files within the NSP packages in which games, DLC and the like are stored. Next up, let's move on to the screen. Not much to add here to Nintendo's specification. It's a 7.9 inch wide color gamma LCD screen with a 1080p resolution, support for HDR10 and VRR up to 120 Hz. An additional detail that hasn't been disclosed is that it's a 10-point multi-touch capacitive touchscreen. And for the record, Switch 1's display was also a 10-point multi-touch variant too. Something that is important to clarify is that as far as Switch 2 developers are concerned, VRR right now at least is indeed a function of the internal display only, and that there is no support at all right now for VRR over HDMI. Uh, for the docked experience. The best theory we have for this is that the dock's display port to HDMI connector doesn't support standard HDMI VRR. But whatever is the cause, we really hope to see Nintendo provide some sort of solution in due course. 
And that's the extent of what we know about Switch 2 right now in terms of its hardware specifications over and above what Nintendo has revealed. But just one minor point of clarification. Uh, throughout this video, we've talked about portable and docked configurations. By and large, in terms of how these modes are applied, that is accurate. However, the docked mode is more accurately described as a performance mode. And in reality, there's nothing stopping developers using the undocked specifications in docked mode. It was the same situation on Switch 1, actually. But in the vast majority of scenarios, developers moved to the performance mode for docked play. By and large, the leaks going all the way back to 2021 have proven accurate, which gives you some idea of just how long it takes to get a console to market. But with development kits now in developer hands and some visibility on the games that have been revealed so far, we can get a much better measure of what the system is capable of. But with that being said, particularly when looking at third party titles, remember, this is just the beginning. And like Switch 1 before it, the quality of those games from a technical perspective will inevitably rise significantly across the generation. In terms of things to look out for, well, game chat is clearly an important part of the Switch 2 package, but information we've discovered says that it does have a significant impact on system resources to the point where Nintendo actually provides developers with a game chat testing tool. This simulates API latency and L3 cache misses uh, that the real world game chat incurs on the system. This allows developers to actually test game chat um, without having to run the game chat system with actual players. DLSS, as confirmed by CD Projekt Red and as seen in Cyberpunk 2077 and almost certainly in Street Fighter VI, this is indeed built into the Switch 2 development environment with DLSS 1X, 2X and 3X options available in addition to DLAA. So DLAA is basically native resolution rendering with DLSS used purely for extremely high quality anti-aliasing. DLSS 1X, 2X and 3X. In that context, this is likely to be the equivalent to PC's performance, balanced and quality modes. Though Cyberpunk 2077 seems to be using both dynamic resolution scaling and DLSS in concert as opposed to staying fixed to one particular DLSS mode. So at this point, with all the key specifications out there, it really is time to sit back, wait for release, and to get to grips with the games of this brand new system. So at this point, all I can really say is that I hoped you enjoyed the video and the information contained therein. Like, subscribe, share if you did, ring bells and all of that. And yes, please do consider the DF Supporter Program. High quality video downloads of everything we do, news updates from the team, early access to DF Direct Weekly and other stuff. It's all good. And yeah, store.digitalfoundry.net. Do go visit if you fancy supporting us via purchasing our merchandising wares. But that's all for me on this one. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.